The Empire roster has always been called one of the most balanced, with units that are decent at almost everything while not being super specialised into any one area. This hasn't really changed much, and while their roster is still powerful, it certainly lacks in a few areas, especially when compared to all the new factions with their monstrous selection of troops. Still, they're a pretty strong force to be reckoned with, especially from a range, so if you find yourself against them, you better pray you packed an umbrella. First, let's go through the pros and cons of the roster overall. First of all, the pros, they have a huge amount of ranged firepower for taking out low and high armor, large and small targets, and just about anything else you can think of. They also have a strong cav roster, both for ranged and melee, allowing them to get on top of enemies very quickly and deal a ton of damage before your front lines ever see combat. And finally, they have a huge selection of magical laws with a wide range of spells for basically any occasion. As for the cons, they lack any monsters at all, which makes your front lines a lot less beefy than nearly every other faction in the game. They also have a total lack of flying units, which means they can be outmaneuvered by factions that can fly and have no real answer for it other than missiles. And finally, a lot of their damage coming from ranged might be good if you can keep them safe, but if your lines break and the enemies get into your ranged troops, the battle can quickly snowball out of your control. Now let's get into the roster, starting with the Lords. First up, we have Emperor Karl Franz. He's armoured and deals armour-piercing damage and is a duelist. Karl is possibly the most iconic frontlines lord in the game, and he pretty much lives up to that reputation. He's super tough with a ton of armor, has great melee stats for both attack and defense, and deals huge damage with a massive chunk of armor piercing and magical attacks sprinkled on top. Of course, his description says he's a duelist, and while he can take on characters one-on-one -on -one and come out on top, he's just as effective in the middle of the front lines, taking on hordes of enemies. I would send him in there to keep nearby units encouraged and have him spread the damage in his area attacks to hit as many troops as possible. The only thing you need to look out for is letting him get totally surrounded by armor piercing, as under the armor, he doesn't really have the most HP. Other than that, he's fabulous at pretty much any melee combat. He also has three choices of mounts, the Bardered Warhorse, which grants an increased HP, armor, and of course a bunch of speed and charge bonus at the cost of being a slightly large hitbox. You want to use him with a lot more charging and be a lot more careful about getting pinned down as that larger hitbox will spell a quick death when surrounded. He has the Imperial Pegasus, which loses some armor from the Warhorse, but gains speed and HP, as well as the ability to fly. This is of course great for a lot more flanking with that massive speed and flight, but again, be careful of getting pinned down since they're even bigger, so are even easier to take out when surrounded. And finally, they have the Death Claw, not that Death Claw. This loses some speed and melee stats from the Pegasus, but gains even more HP and some weapon strength. This is his final form, and he has a ton of mass and damage in huge area attacks. You can charge him into front lines or back lines, and it doesn't matter what, he'll do great damage. Just be extra careful of letting him get pinned down, as this is also his largest form, so ranged and armor piercing melee are a huge threat. Next up, we have Balthazar Gelt, and he is a supreme spellcaster of the Lore of Metal. As I just said, Balth is of course a supreme one when it comes to spellcasting that Lore of Metal. When it comes to just about anything else, however, He's not great. His armor, his mid, his melee stats are low, and his damage is not even slightly impressive. This adds up to a lord that wants to be used from the backlines only, and for a legendary lord, that's kind of a big letdown. You can technically send him in versus a very low armor and damage units, but aside from that, it's sitting at the back casting spells for old guilds. He has a powerful lore that only gets better with his skills, so keep him casting to help his army wherever needed, in whatever form is required. He also has a couple of mounts. Bardered Warhorse, and Quicksilver, which has more HP, speed, and charge bonus than the Warhorse, and can fly. You still want to use them the same and use that high speed to get spells wherever needed to keep up the support for the entire army. Just keep him out of the sights of enemy ranged, and he should do just fine. Next up, we have Marcus Wolfhart. He fires armor piercing anti large missiles, has stalk, and can fire whilst on the move. It says Marcus is a hybrid weapons lord, but really, he's a ranged specialist with just about passable melee stats. His melee prowess is limited due to his low armor and damage. His stats are great, but even if he lands every hit, they still won't hit very hard at all. From a range, however, he's a menace. He deals massive amounts of armor piercing and anti-large damage from a huge range and has a huge amount of ammo for the amount of damage that he does. This makes him into a large single target assassin that excels versus huge monsters and mounted heroes. Single entities are the preferred target to maximize his chances of hitting and ensure that all of that huge damage goes straight to a HP bar. Use his vanguard deployment and stalk to get into a strong flanking position and then rain fire onto unsuspecting enemies once they're engaged in combat. Keep him out of melee if you can, since as I said earlier, he's really not the best. Next up we have Volkmar the Grim and this guy has access to battle prayers, specifically the Grand Battle Prayers. So Battle Prayers are kind of like lesser spells that cost no magic but have fairly long cooldowns. These allow them to buff the attack and damage resistance of nearby allied units, as well as deal magical damage in an area around the caster. Alongside his prayers, he also has some okay damage with magical and flaming attacks, though his armor piercing is somewhat lacking. His armor is also a little bit weak, so against high damage foes, he can go down a little quickly in his basic form. While he's like this, keep him close to his front lines to provide buffs with his prayers, and only send him into combat versus very weak units. He also has a couple of mounts, the Bardered Warhorse, 
and the War Altar of Sigmar. This grants him a massive increase to his tankiness with more HP, double the armor, and unbreakable leadership. He's also faster, has more charge bonus, and a small bonus versus infantry, but he does lose melee stats and even more damage. This makes him into a tanky buff machine that will churn out those prayers, as well as the Banishment's Bound spell. Just keep him in the middle of your lines and out of the middle of the enemies, spamming prayers as much as you possibly can. And finally, we have big Boris Toddbringer. He's armored and shielded and a melee expert. Toddy is your Billy Basic Frontlines Lord, with pretty mid stats for pretty much everything. He's reasonably tanky with high armor and a silver shield, so can take a surprising amount of punishment for such a basic unit. His melee stats are pretty nice, but the damage is pretty piss poor, with a severe lack of armor piercing. He's fine for the Frontlines versus low armor units, but anything tougher in the late game, and he's going to struggle without a lot of help. He also has three mounts, the Barded Warhorse, Imperial Pegasus, and the Imperial Griffin. This gains him HP and weapon strength over the Pegasus, but loses some speed, melee stats, and charge bonus. It also has a massive amount of more armor piercing damage, so now it allows Toddy to take on tough units with ease. You can still use that excellent speed and flight to flank over and around units to get into those precious backlines. You can also just send him into the front lines, and as long as he doesn't get surrounded, he should do great work. And finally, of course, with all this damage, he makes for a great character killer, so any lords or heroes are fair targets. Now come to the generic lords, and first up with the Arch Lectors. These guys are armoured and can use the grand battle prayers just like Volkmar. These lads have the same prayers as Volkmar, so are brilliant support lords. Sadly, they also inherit the less than stellar damage, so aside from prayer support, they don't have a lot going for them. Compared directly to Volkmar, they have much more armour and some defence, but less HP, leadership, speed, attack and charge bonus. Aside from these minor differences, they want to be used mostly the same, so only send them in versus low armour units on the front lines, and spread those prayers as much as possible. And they also have access to the Bardard Warhorse mount. Next up we have the Generals of the Empire, and these are armoured and shielded. They are pretty much a nerfed Boris with slightly worse stats for HP, leadership, melee stats and charge bonus, as well as drop into a bronze shield. Pretty much the same, just be a little more careful since they are just that tiny bit worse. And they also have the exact same three mounts, Bardard Warhorse, Imperial Pegasus, and the Imperial Griffin. And finally, we come to the Huntsman General. This guy can deal anti-large damage from his missiles, has Vanguard deployment, stalk, and can fire whilst moving. And these are pretty much Marcus, but worse in quite a few ways. They have less armor, leadership, melee stats, and an increased overall missile strength, but less armor piercing damage. This makes him worse versus any more armored foes, and better versus less armored, but later on, there isn't going to be a lot of units. What they do have that's better than Marcus, however, is three abilities that make them pair excellently with a Firecaster. Oil Flask makes units far more vulnerable to fire damage, and Hail of Fire and Arrow of Akshai will capitalize on this to deal a massive amount of damage to units, even if they have a lot of armor. If you're happy with this pairing, then they work excellent. Excellently. But if you prefer another caster, then nothing crazy to write home about. Now we come to the heroes, and first up we have the legendary heroes from Marcus Wolfhart. First we have Hertwig Van Hal. This guy fires armor piercing missiles, is a duelist, and can fire whilst on the move. This guy is a great single target killer, especially from a range. His armor piercing magical attacks will cut through pretty much any defense the enemy can throw at you, allowing him to deal a massive amount of damage to single entities from the safety of a decent range. In melee, his damage isn't as strong as it lacks a lot of armor piercing, as well as any impressive melee stats. Keep him out of range until he burns through his considerable amount of ammo, then send him into the front lines versus low damage and armor foes to maximize his potential. Next up, we have Yorick Grimm. This guy is a ballistics expert, he's armored and deals armor piercing damage. Yorick is, of course, first and foremost, an excellent ranged unit with a high range, a ton of ammo, and a massive amount of armor piercing damage. This makes him great taking out single targets from afar with that damage, but it does have just the one caveat. It fires in a flat arc, so you need to get a clear line of sight to hit your targets. And when you're as tall as Yorick, that can be hard to come by. Get him a good angle either on the backs or sides of foes, or simply go for large targets that you can see over his allies' heads, and he should do great. Alongside being a powerful ranged fighter, he also has the great weapon strength and toughness with that huge armor stat. Sadly, his melee stats aren't anything incredible, but still, if he gets caught in melee, he should hold his own and even do some okay damage on the off chance he lands a shot. Keep him at a range if you can, but if he's out of ammo, don't be scared to get him stuck in. Next, we have Clara. She has Forest Stalker, which grants her bonuses to defense and accuracy whenever in forest. Vanguard Deployment is a duelist and a master ambusher, which means she remains hidden on any terrain, even whilst firing and moving. Yet another hybrid weapons hero from the Wolfheart collection. Clara is possibly the weakest we've seen so far, at least when it comes to armor piercing damage. She lacks a lot of it in both melee and from a range, but she does have plenty of non-armor piercing and magical damage, so any resistance based units are going to feel the pain. She also has a massive range to deal this damage from, and it's got a steep arc so she can hit basically anything on the field without too much trouble. Have her focus on any less armored targets and stand by out of ranged units once she gets her abilities online, as the buffs for nearby units can be pretty great, as we saw in the campaign section. She really should avoid melee at all costs, since her damage is poor and her below average armor and very average melee stats 
will result in a quick death if she's against anything even halfway decent. And finally, we have Roderick Langeel. This guy is armoured and shielded and has anti-large damage. Roderick is the tank of the Wolfheart heroes and it shows. He has a ton of armour as well as a bronze shield and some decent defence stats. His damage isn't anything incredible, even with that bonus versus large, so all he can really do in the late game is tank damage and blob enemies up to give your army something to fire at. He really is that simple and he hasn't got any spells or abilities or range damage. Just send him in alongside your front lines and see if you can find a low armour unit for him to attack to make the most of his very meagre damage. Now onto the generic heroes. First up we have the Warrior Priest, and these guys are armoured and can use Battle Prayers. And they are pretty much just weaker versions of the Arch Lectors. They have less HP, armour, leadership, defence and weapon strength but gain increased speed, attack and charge bonus. They also have weaker versions of the Battle Prayers that Lectors use, but aside from that, they function pretty much the same so want to be used as such. Keep them in the middle of your units to utilise those prayers on cooldown for a ton of buffs, send them in versus units with low armour to allow them to actually have an impact, and be careful to keep them from being surrounded by high armour piercing damage. Do all of this and they should get great value. And finally, they have a Barded Warhorse mount. Next we have the Empire Captains and these are armoured and shielded, and these are more or less the smaller generals of the Empire with less HP, leadership, melee stats and weapon strength. Aside from these minor differences, they can be used more or less the same. Get them on the front lines to encourage nearby troops, but have them target low armour and damaged troops to ensure they can deal any damage and survive. They're pretty basic and pretty boring, and honestly, not great if you ask me. They also have access to a couple of mounts, the Bardered Warhorse and the Imperial Pegasus. The Witch Hunters have armour-piercing missiles, are duelists, and can fire whilst moving. These are literally the exact same as Hertwig, but have slightly worse stats in HP, armour, leadership and melee stats, but use them the exact same and they should do just fine. Spam missiles onto priority targets and only send them in once you absolutely have to. Not going to repeat more than that. And our final hero type are the Battle Wizards. These are pure spellcasters and can come with the lore of death, beasts, shadows, life, fire, heavens or light. And finally we have the casters and bad news, these guys are super basic spellcasters through and through and don't really do anything but that. They have terrible armour and melee stats and low damage so anything more than a light breeze and they're going to fall over. Grab your chosen law or just use a lore's tier list to pick a good one and then stand them on the back lines and cast away whilst keeping them safe. Do not engage in combat no matter what as they will simply die against basically any other unit in the game. They also have a couple of mounts the Barded Warhorse and the Imperial Pegasus. Now we come to the melee infantry. First up we have the Spearmen, these are a tier 1 unit, have anti-large damage and charge defence versus large. These are your basic early game front line and honestly they're not that bad. They have charge reflection and defence versus large so it can be hard to move once they plant their feet. They also have decent defence so make for decent early game front line holders as well as some halfway decent damage even if there's not much armour piercing. Add on the anti-large and I'd go as far as calling their damage good for the price. You of course want to use them as a front line when you have no other recruitment capability and then shift them out to the flanks. Either way, most of the time they'll need missile, magic or cav support so give them that and they'll do just fine. They're basic and they're cheap but they're pretty good. They also come in another variation. The Shielded Spearmen, these are a tier 1 unit, are now shielded and still have anti-large damage and charge defence versus large. These gain a bronze shield and a bit more defence making them a bit more tanky. Still use them the exact same as their damage doesn't get any better, so having them hold enemies still and letting other units do all the damage is still absolutely the way to go. No other changes than that, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Next up we have the Swordsmen, these are another tier 1 unit and are shielded. Swordsmen are a bit of a lateral move as far as early game front lines go. They have 10 less defence than shielded spears, but they gain attack and weapon strength and charge bonus, making them a little less tanky and a little more damaging on those front lines. It really depends what you want from your front lines, since both will end up doing pretty much the same thing, but spears will survive longer and swords will do more damage whilst they're there. Choose which works best for you and then support whichever you pick with missiles, magic and cav to wipe enemies as quickly as possible and take the least amount of damage on your units that you can. Albedeers are next up and these are a tier 2 unit. These deal armour piercing anti-large damage and have charge defence versus large. Halberds are basically a direct upgrade to Spearmen. They have more HP, leadership, melee stats, charge bonus and a nice bit of armour piercing damage all while still having anti-large charge defence. This makes them a great choice for your endgame flank protectors as they can hold off a charge from large targets and infantry alike with their great defence and decent damage. Of course they still want to be supported by missiles, magic and cav since they don't have the most armour themselves but against mid game cav they'll clap. Grab a couple to protect your flanks and focus down large targets on the front lines and they should do great work. Next up we have flagellants, these are a tier 2 units, are allegedly damage dealers, have frenzy, unbreakable and the strength of the penitent ability. This grants physical resistance and melee defence whenever they are losing in combat. Flagellants are honestly pretty useless 90% of the time. They might have a decent weapon damage and breakable, but their total lack of armour and poor defence means whatever they're going against is going to wipe them out in moments if it even has a moderate amount of damage. With Volkmar, they get buffs to make them decent, but without him, they are pretty poor and I basically never take them. 
Their saving grace is their strength of the penitent ability that makes them way tanky when losing, so you can toss them in versus wherever you want and they'll become slightly more tanky whilst they slowly die. If you really want to take them, then throw as much support as you possibly can at them since they will be losing 90% of the time, so you may as well make use of them before they're all gone. And our final melee infantry unit is the Great Swords. These are a tier 2 unit, are armoured and deal armour piercing anti-infantry damage. These are your endgame frontlines units and they were once the gold standard for frontlines. They have great armour, leadership and damage with halfway decent melee stats too. Versus most other frontlines units, even armoured ones, they will clean up with huge damage and a bonus versus infantry, allowing them to cut through the toughest defences with ease. Versus resistance, they will struggle, but versus anything else, it's a breeze. They are quite vulnerable to ranged fire with the lack of shields, so move them out of sight until the coast is clear for them to move in. Also provide them with support versus any particularly tough targets, as you don't want to make them take more damage than they need, especially if it means losing a very expensive unit. I like four of them flanked by halberds for the end game for a ton of damage and armor to take on whatever enemies can throw at you. Next up we have the ranged infantry and first we have archers. These are a tier 1 unit and are weak versus armor. These are your basic early game ranged units. They have a decent range with low non armor piercing damage and a nice chunk of ammo. You want to use them to fire over your front line's heads onto enemies as they approach before moving them to get a good angle once the lines clash. As I mentioned their damage is low so consider firing to take down key targets rather than spreading the damage around as a single unit of them can take a number of volleys before they even get a kill. Finally keep them out of melee at all costs as their piss poor stats and terrible armour means they will fold like a lawn chair if they get attacked by pretty much anything. Now we come to the free company militia. These are a tier 1 unit and are a hybrid unit so are a decent melee combatant as well as coming with vanguard deployments but they are still weak versus armour. Free company are one of my favourite units for the empire simply because of how useful they are in the first few turns. They aren't great at anything but they are pretty good at a few things. For example the decent in front lines. Not great but decent so can take on some weak units and maybe come out the other side alive and having caused a little bit of damage. They're also decent at range damage with some short range pistol based missiles and can do pretty well when used to focus fire. I like to use them in the front of my front lines to attack as enemies approach then to flank the front lines with their above average speed and shoot into their backs and sides to get even more free value before finally sending them in versus weak fighting units to get even more value out of them. Yes they do fall off drastically once enemies have any armor at all but while you use them you can basically make a doom stack of them and get away with it. Next we come to the crossbowmen. These are another tier 1 unit and have a good range. The crossbowmen are a slight upgrade over archers with more range and ammo. They technically lose one missile strength but they gain a better ratio of armor piercing so that's really a gain versus anything that matters. You can still use them pretty much the same but now enjoyed firing from a much further range and doing a whole lot more damage whilst you do. There isn't really much to say since they just do the exact same job but better. Focus fire on anything that's super important or spread the damage around if there's not anything too serious. Either way, they will get great value. Next we come to the handgunners. These are a tier 2 unit and fire armor piercing missiles. These guys have less range than crossbows but a massive boost in armor piercing damage at the cost of firing in a straight line. This makes them much more of a pain to use without risk. You can still set them up to fire as enemies approach but once the lines clash, getting the angle will mean getting on the flanks of enemies meaning a lot more risk of being caught out of position. Carefully move them around and fire as many volleys as you safely can. If it's really not safe, you can focus on large targets they can clearly see above your unit's heads but if the enemy has none of these, you shit out of luck. Get the best angle you can and pray you don't hit your own troops. Whoever feels this damage is going to be in a world of hurt, so you better just make sure it's the enemies. And our final ranged infantry are the Huntsmen. These are a tier 2 units and come with anti-large damage, vanguard deployments, stalk and can fire whilst moving. These lads have the same range as crossbows but now come with some slight stat improvements including a saucy bit of bonus versus large. This of course makes them way better versus large targets and a little bit worse versus everything else due to a drop in non-bonus damage. Of course you want to use these guys to focus down any large targets you can find on the enemy force and make the most of that bonus damage. If they don't have any then find the lowest armor targets you can and they will do. Otherwise their damage will simply not punch through. You can still adopt the same play style aside from this, so leave them at the front of the line to start off with and then move them back to fire over the front line's heads once the lines are clashing. Still have that firing arc, so they'll have no problem doing this. Now we come to the cavalry. First up we have the Empire Knights. These are a tier 2 unit, are armoured and shielded. These guys are of course a shot cav, so have a pretty tasty charge bonus for such an early unit. They of course also have terrible melee stats, so cycle charging is how you want to use them rather than sustained combat. If you do this, you should see great damage with every charge with very little cost to their own HP, with their massive armour and a bronze shield. Keep them on the move at all times and keep the hammer and anvil going and you should do just fine. Go for the back lines or front lines, whatever is the high priority in that battle and as long as they don't get pinned down, they should do just fine. Next up we have the Reichsguard, these are a tier 3 unit and are armoured and shielded. You're about to hear this a few times but these lads are basically just the Empire Knights but better in every single stat apart from speed. They perform the same job at the same rates but will deal more damage and take even less damage with their stat increases across the board. 
use them the exact same, tagging back lines and front lines with ease, just now do it even better. And now we come to the Knights of the Blazing Sun. These are another tier 3 unit, Ramad and Shielded, and they are members of the Blazing Sun chapter, which means they are more expensive unless you own their chapter house in Talapheim. And again, we have another unit that is more or less the same as the Empire Knights, but with some stat changes. These guys have a massive charge bonus, as well as an improved weapon strength and attack over even the Reichsguard. They do lose some armor, leadership and defense, but that hardly matters when you move this fast and hit this hard. To stop it all off, they have that fire damage and spell resistance, so we'll do even better versus undead units, and shrug spells off much more easily. Still, you can use them pretty much the same to cycle charge pretty much whatever you set your sights on, whether that's front lines or back lines. Just keep them on the move and make the most of that stonking charge bonus, and they will do a great work. Next, we come to the Demogriff Knights. These are a tier 3 unit, rounded and shielded, and deal armor piercing damage. Demogriffs are a bit of a lateral move from the Knights. They have much less charge bonus, but have some consistent melee stats, so are much better if you're not the greatest at micromanagement. They have a great weapon damage and a ton of armor piercing as well as armor of their own so can actually do really well in sustained combat if you leave them in whether intentionally or accidentally you can of course still charge them and they'll get some decent value likely better than leave them in combat but whichever you prefer they can do it just fine just make sure they don't get totally bogged down and surrounded as they can still go down fast if they can't escape they also come in another variation the halberd demogriff knights these are a tier 3 unit, are armoured and deal armour piercing anti-large damage. The halberds cause them to drop the shields and lose melee stats, charge bonus and weapon strength all to gain some anti-large bonus damage. Versus large, they will absolutely do a better job, so using them as cav killers or large target assassins will do just fine. But against literally anything else, they will be worse in pretty much every way. They are more vulnerable to range than melee damage, so exercise a lot more caution when using them. Personally, I prefer to stick to the base unit for the added defence and offence versus anything that's not large, and then leave huge units to my ranged units. Next up we come to the missile cav and chariots, and first up we have the pistoliers. These are a tier 1 unit, are very fast, come with vanguard deployment, and their damage is weak versus armor. These are a great early game skirmishing unit with their very high speed and halfway decent damage versus non-armored targets. Against anything resembling armor, their damage will fall off a cliff, but until that point, they'll do great work. Use their speed to get around the backs of enemies and fight into them for free value. Stick them on skirmish and leave them to their own devices, giving them the occasional order to move in if they get chased too far away. Also avoid letting them get into melee combat at all costs. Their stats are embarrassingly bad so they will lose to literally anything. In fact keep them clear of all damage as they have no armor or melee stats so anything can take them down in melee or from a range. Next up we have Outriders and these are tier 2 units. These have armor piercing missiles and vanguard deployments. These guys lose a bit of speed, attack, charge bonus and overall missile strength but gain a huge amount more armor piercing missile damage, range and ammunition. All of these changes basically boil down to the fact that they deal more damage to more armored targets so can now actually be used to focus fire beyond the first few turns. Aside from this massive change in damage however, they don't really change how you want to use them. You still want to stick them on skirmish and send them around enemies to fire uncontested into their troops backs. You still want to avoid melee at all costs since they still can't fight pretty much anything and you still want to avoid any forms of damage including range since they are so soft and squishy that a light drizzle could knock them from their horses. Do all of this and they should get some great value. We also have another variation, the grenade launcher outriders. These are a tier 2 unit and deal anti-infantry damage, come with vanguard deployments and cannot attack the air. These lads trade some range, ammo and HP for a big increase to damage. The armor piercing icon isn't there but their actual damage shoots up in both the impact and the explosion including armor piercing. This makes them amazing at taking out clumps of enemy units, even if they're super tough, as those explosions can hit many entities per volley, resulting in entire units being wiped out in just a couple of shots. Sadly, they lose the ability to target flying units, so if the enemy has a lot of those, you are pretty screwed. But if you take out everything on the ground, it doesn't really matter. These are a great upgrade as long as you have something to take care of flying units, and will get a ton of value in combat right through to the end game if you really want. Their damage is just obscene, especially when combined with their speed, so just get them onto the flank and rain death onto the battlefield. Next up we have the War Wagons. These are a tier 2 unit, are armoured, deal armour piercing missile damage, and can fire whilst moving. Anyone that's played Total War for more than a few minutes probably knows that the War Wagon just isn't very good. On paper, it seems okay, it can fire on the move from a decent range, has high missile strength and decent ammo, but don't be fooled, this unit sucks in many ways, so let's go through them. Look at the size of it, it's literally a fridge being dragged around by horses, so enemy range will have no problem taking it apart. Plus, if they even get close to melee, they'll be pinned down with ease and die in mere moments. It's also pretty bloody slow for a chariot unit, so it's easily caught out by even the slowest cav, meaning getting all that ammo spent is quite a challenge. Yes, the missile strength is okay and it's even good, but getting a clean shot without dying is a real challenge so they're just pretty terrible. Just use Outriders instead, they deal as much or more damage and are way faster and easier to use. They also come in another variation, the Mortar War Wagons. These are a tier 3 units, are armoured and deal anti-infantry damage. The Mortar War Wagons share most of what made the base unit terrible, but they have one major difference that makes them almost good. They have a firing arc and a massive range, so they don't have to put themselves in danger to fire. 
This means you can sit them in the back of your lines nice and safe and have them rain fire onto enemies. Their damage isn't the most armor piercing, but it has some pretty spicy explosions, so they'll be hitting plenty of entities, especially if aimed at a clump. Just be careful not to aim too close to your own troops, as these explosions can be just as deadly to them as they are to enemies. Still, avoid letting them get caught out, but with the range and firing arc, this is way easier. Most of the time, just sit them in the back and watch the fireworks. And finally, we come to the artillery and war machines. First up, we have the mortars, and these are a tier 2 units and deal anti-infantry damage. Believe it or not, these are the exact same as the war wagon mortars, but without the wagons. They have the exact same missile strength, range, and ammo, but lose in pretty much every other stat, making them much slower and somehow even weaker in melee. Use them as you would with the wagons, at the back, launching shots from afar and the biggest clumps of enemies you can find for maximum damage. The only difference in how to use them is to take a little more care to keep them safe from being flanked, as they cannot run and cannot fight off foes, so it will spell their doom if enemies get too close. Other than this, just set them and try not to forget them. Next we have the Great Cannons. These are a tier 2 unit and deal armor piercing anti-large missile damage over a massive range. These lads have a huge range and a pretty massive damage, so can deal devastating blows from the entire map away. The only downside to this damage is their direct firing arc, meaning they need line of sight on their targets to safely fire. If enemies have some large or giant units, then have them focus on these once lines clash for some easy safe value. If they don't, then you're pretty out of luck unless you can find a safe way to get them on the flanks, which is doubtful with their pathetic speed and terrible melee stats. Just try and get as much value as you can before the lines clash, and then look for opportunities as they arise in combat. They can be a bit of a faff to use, but their damage really is outstanding, so it can be worth the hassle. Next we have the Hellblaster Volley Guns. These are a tier 3 unit and have armor piercing missiles. These are very similar to the cannon, but lose some range in exchange for a huge boost in armor piercing damage. They also fire many more missiles per volley, so can do great versus infantry, as well as single entities and large targets. Honestly, you can use them pretty much the exact same as cannons. Fire on enemies as they approach, and then look for opportunities once the lines clash. They still have the flat firing arc and terrible speed, so getting shots off will be challenging, but if you manage it, you will get some excellent damage. Next up, we have the Hellstorm Rocket Battery. This is a tier 3 unit and has armor piercing missiles that deal anti-infantry damage over a huge range, but with not the best accuracy. Now we're into the really good stuff. These bad boys are just a treat to use and watch in combat. They have that huge range so can rain fire on enemies from the entire map away. They may not be the most accurate, but when you're firing this much damage down range, all you need is a few hits and you'll be getting some pretty insane volume. All their damage is in these massive explosions and does amazing versus armor and non-armor, no problems at all, so you want to make sure to target big clumps of enemies to make the most of those explosions and firing arc, since hitting huge targets with this thing can literally just be hit or miss. The only thing you need to be really careful of with this lad is once the lines clash, the lack of accuracy can spell disaster if it decides to hit your own troops, so try to avoid targeting units close to them and you should be just fine. And it goes without saying, but for all these artillery pieces, don't let them get caught in combat as they won't last a second. Keep them safe at the back and keep firing until they run out of ammo. Next up we have the Luminarch of Haish, and this is a tier 3 unit, has armor piercing missiles, Solheim's bolts of illumination, which basically means it fires massive damage that's very accurate, but also very slow to fire. It also has the magical auras, the aura of protection, and the locus of Haish abilities. And as I mentioned, that low rate of fire. This is an incredibly unique unit that specializes in taking out single entities over vast distances. It fires highly accurate beams over this massive range that deals ridiculous amounts of damage, both base and armor piercing. These missiles also deal magic and fire damage, so basically anything it hits is going to feel the pain and a large amount of it. This damage can only occur every 22 seconds, which is a huge reload time and kneecaps its damage output considerably. It also has a fairly limited ammo pool, so choose your shots carefully and pray you don't miss as you'll have a long time to think about it before the next volley. This is another unit with a flat firing arc, so line of sight is required to fire. That being said, this is a single entity killer, with the damage being extremely focused in a small area. So firing at large foes once combat clashes is great to use its ammo. Plus, if you really need an angle, it has pretty decent speed so you can get into a flanking position if needed. Try to keep it close to your front lines to ground them protection and fire on key targets to burst them down as fast as you can. Still avoid combat as much as possible as the melee stats and hitbox spell a quick doom if enemies decide to focus it. And finally, we come to the steam, the meme, the steam tank. This is a tier 3 unit, it's armoured and deals armour piercing damage both in melee and from a range, it causes terror and is unbreakable. This is the one and only war machine of the Empire and it really does what it says in the tin. It's a tank, it's super armoured and can deal a massive amount of damage from a huge range with its massive main cannon. This is another flat firing arc unfortunately, so you're going to need to have a line of sight on your targets to get a clear shot, so large targets are, again, a great option for aiming these lads at. Of course, if there are none of these that they can see, they also have a decent speed so can get into a good firing position with ease and get shots off at whatever needs taken out on the enemy force. If they manage to run out of ammo, they also have excellent front lines prowess with that insane toughness and massive armor piercing damage with a bonus versus infantry. Toss them into the biggest infantry clump you can find and watch them slot entire units. 
They can be taken out with enough armor piercing, but it'll take units a very long time to get rid of them, especially since they're unbreakable. Fire from a range for as long as you can, and then dive in and get loads of value no matter what it's doing. Now it comes to Regiments of Renown, I'll call out each unit, what it's a unit of, and the differences between it and the base unit. Sigmar's Sons are a unit of swordsmen, and gain increases to HP, weapon strength and charge bonus, as well as gaining unbreakable. The Tata Souls are a flagellant unit, and gain 40 more entities and a bunch of HP whilst losing one attack. The Death Jacks are a unit of archers, and gain vanguard deployment, stalk and snipe. Sterling's Revenge are free company militia, and gain much more armor piercing missile strength and immune to psychology. The Silver Bullets are handgunners, and gain magical ammunition, range and stalk. The White Wolves are huntsmen, and gain attack, defense, weapon strength and charge bonus, and also gain the encourage and immune to psychology. Zindler's Reichsguard are Reichsguard units and gain Vanguard deployments and immune to psychology. The Royal Altdorf Griffites are Halberd Demogriff units and can now cause terror and lose one defense. The Black Lions are a Hellblaster War Wagon, which is a unique unit that functions like a Gatling gun and has a huge armor piercing damage, capable of wiping out pretty much anything you're aiming at in seconds. Get it on a flank and keep it safe from being attacked, as it still sucks in melee. The Hammer of the Witches is a great cannons unit, it gains defense, ammo, missile strength, magical ammo and physical resistance but loses one attack. The Sunmaker is a Hellstorm rocket battery which gains a ton of damage and loses a lot of ammunition. And finally the Templehof Luminarch is a Luminarch of Heish and gains a net of Amnitok bound spell and the Encourage ability. And finally we have the Elect Count State Troops which are part of the Elect Counts mechanic which are basically just regiments of renown that you unlock by the mechanic. The Swords of Ulrich are a unit of swordsmen and gain attack, weapon strength, charge bonus, frenzy and fear. Eldred's Guard are a shielded spearman unit and gain a silver shield, 40 armor, expert charge defense and encourage. The Nordland Mariners are a Halberdiers unit and gain speed, expert charge defense and the rowdy ability. The Caraburg Great Swords are a Great Swords unit and gain unbreakable and the bathed in blood ability. The Stir River Patrol are a crossbowman unit and gain missile strength, fire ammo and suppressed imbued missiles which slows any target hit. Gundaman Shofires are a handgunners unit and gain increases to every stat but ammo and missile strength. They also gain vanguard deployment and stalk. The Stubborn Bulls are an Empire Knights unit and gain increases to every stat but armor and speed and lose some charge bonus, but they also gain immunity to psychology. The Knights of the Everlasting Light are an Empire Knights unit and gain a Silver Shield, Magical Attack and the Blinding Radiance ability. The Knights of Mora are an Empire Knights unit and can now cause fear and terror and gain the Grim Resolve passive ability. The Noble Sons Abroad are a Pistoliers unit and gain increases to armor, attack and defense, charge bonus and missile strength. The Bordermen are a Grenade Launch Outriders unit and lose overall missile strength but gain a lot of armor piercing missile damage. The Soot Sons Guns are a Mortars unit and gain missile strength, fire and magical ammo. And finally the Emperor's Wrath is a Steam Tank and gains missile strength burnt imbued missiles, the emergency vents ability and the kaboom passive. And now finally we come to the army compositions. In Warhammer 3 every unit has a tier from 1 to 3 and I'm going to be using these tiers to make you armies for the early, mid and late game so that you are set for every single step of your campaign. First of all tier 1, our army composition is going to have an arch lector, 2 shielded spearmen, 4 swordsmen, 4 free company militia, 5 crossbowmen and 4 pistoliers. When choosing the lord I was torn between the arch lectors and the huntsman generals but in the end I went for the lector. Their enhanced battle prayers are just so strong and you can bring any cast you want with them and get great value. Early on they're not the greatest and are simple front lines lords but later on they get a whole lot better. The front lines are fairly tough with all the shields and great defense, the spears will defend the flanks while the swords take the middle of combat and do some okay damage to whatever they find. I went for swords over a full line of spears since the extra damage will help in the early game when damage is low from basically every unit on the field. The free company are going to be working as flanking missile troops that will run around the flanks of enemies to fire into their backs and sides to take them down as quickly as possible. Early on they'll be able to defend against most things that catch them out doing this so it's a pretty safe strat that can get some great value. The crossbows are obviously going to be on the back lines and do a ton of damage to basically anything in the early game especially with their massive range and the pistoliers will provide even more missile strength and flanking capabilities. Yes you don't have loads to take out enemy range but this tape you don't have any choice so do your best with the shields and send the free company in if you can and they should do all right against most early game troops. Tier two, still got the Arch Lector, now picking up a Grey Wizard, we're also gonna grab two Halberdiers, four Great Swords, three Huntsmen, three Handgunners, two Grenade Launcher Outriders, two Mortars, and two Great Cannons. The Arch Lector should have their prayers online by now and maybe a mount, so be zipping around the battlefield, providing buffs to troops wherever needed, and taking part in some very light combat. The Grey Wizard brings some magical damage and utility to the table and the Lore of Shadows is just a great pick at all times because it's just so damn good. The front lines are getting a massive upgrade in damage and toughness with the Halberds being great at stopping charges in their tracks and doing some nice damage and the Great Swords being super tough and highly damaging to whatever you place in front of them. Everyone is a bit more vulnerable to ranged so make sure you keep them safe on the approach and let them do what they do best once the lines meet. The range line is pretty top tier with armor piercing straight line units as well as arc units that excel versus large targets. Yes, handgunners need that line of sight, but if they can get it, the damage is outstanding and will tear anything to shreds no matter how much armor they have. Huntsmen aren't the best versus armor, but against large targets, they will clap cheeks, and these days there are a lot of large targets wandering around the map, so it's worthwhile to have something just for them. The grenade launchers are going to continue the flanking work of the pistoliers and focus on any clumps they can find to do devastating damage with their explosive attacks. 
Mortars will also focus on any clumps with little armor to get the most of their armor piercing damage, and the cannons will be focusing down any large single entities enemies bring with their huge armor piercing projectiles. And finally, we come to tier 3. So we've got the Arch Lector and the Grey Wizard. The front lines stay in the same, so is the ranged infantry, but we're getting two Dome Griff Knights, two Hellstorm Rocket Batteries, a Luminarch of Heish, and a Meme Tank. Now, the Arch Lector won't have changed much since last year, as he only has the one mount, but you can grab all sorts of skills to make them more powerful in combat or buff your entire army. The choice is yours. The Great Wizard should have all their spells and amounts, so be a menace placing damage, buffs and debuffs on the battlefield where needed with ease. As I mentioned, no change to the front line since we can't get anything better, and the same with the ranged infantry. The Demogriffs are going to provide some backline harassment that the army has been sorely lacking until now. It will take on any ranged units with ease and make it much safer for your army to move up without having to worry about being torn to shreds. The Hellstorm will rain fire on opponents on the approach and soften up entire armies before the lines clash to make your job much easier once they do. The Luminite will focus on any single entity targets with those devastating missiles, and the tank will fire whatever the Luminite doesn't or get involved on the front lines if they need the support. And that is just about everything you need to know on how to play the Empire in battle. We've got the Dwarf Campaign Guide coming next week, so subscribe if you want to see that. I am hoping to hit 50k by the end of the year, so I would appreciate the assistance. If you enjoyed this video and or found it useful, then consider dropping it a like. If you really enjoy the content and want to support it directly, then consider becoming a member on YouTube or a Patreon on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into your future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shoutouts at the end videos, just like Henry took of his support at the Officer's Tier. A thank you to all supporters, one last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.